Ooh, here we are again. Finally reviewing something I believe I've already made like five videos on. This feels like the end of an era. Except it's not the end of an era because I'm gonna be returning this and then gonna buy the 15 inch MacBook Pro with touch bar and then review that and compare the specs to this one. So that's happening at the end of December. So I guess uh, get used to this. It's MacBook month. I wanna bring out something honest with you so that I can clear up a few things. The only other laptop I have ever owned was the 12 inch MacBook I had earlier this year. I reviewed that and that's all I've really had as a laptop. Never owned the 2013, 14, 15 MacBooks, any of those before that. So that being said, I don't really miss MagSafe for having a USB port or an SD card slot because I never had those. So that's why I'm not going to be complaining about it much in this review. I'm just not used to having those things. And in my experience, it hasn't made a drastic difference using those little dongles here and there. I'll dive right into performance because I know that's all you guys really care about. I'm an Adobe guy, okay? I've used Final Cut Pro in the past. I prefer the Adobe app ecosystem. This video was edited on Adobe Premiere. As soon as soon as I got this and unboxed it, I immediately loaded all of the footage into Adobe Premiere to see how it could handle it. Keep in mind, I film my videos at 1080p at 60 frames a second. And keep in mind, this is the lowest spec MacBook Pro you can buy, so it's only up from here. This is as bad as it gets in terms of specs. And it took that footage like a boss. Do people still say that? I guess that's not a thing anymore. Anyway, the specs were on fleek. No? Okay. I'll stop trying. I can edit my video at full resolution with no lag at all, so I didn't even have to go in Premiere and downscale the playback resolution. It could handle it at full. That was great. It was something the 12 inch MacBook definitely couldn't do. And on came to the next test, something the 12 inch MacBook definitely couldn't do. Multi-camera editing. Me and my friends make podcasts together. Video podcasts, so not just audio. We like to have visuals for people to watch so that, you know, everyone out there can pretend they have friends. I'm with you there. And to do these video podcasts, we had four 1080p cameras recording at the same time. They are 1080p at 30 frames a second, not 60. But still, that's a lot of data to be processing for a computer. The MacBook Pro could edit that too. Didn't even have to turn down the preview resolution. It took it like a ball. I gotta stop saying that. Gotta stay relevant. So no problems there, which was also really nice for the lowest spec MacBook Pro there is. Now on our main channel, we also like to do little comedy sketches. And since those are technically directed films, we like to up the resolution there to 4K because it's high res and 24 frames a second looks the most cinematic. So we went ahead and shot our short in 4K like we usually do. And I put it on the MacBook Pro to see how we could handle it and nope, nope, abandon ship, abandon ship. Crap, crap, shoot. Yeah, it couldn't do it. Lag like no tomorrow. I know for sure that if I was editing with Final Cut Pro, it could definitely take 4K video. Even the 12 inch MacBook could do that. I'm not going to switch, okay? I like Adobe Premiere. I like the apps that partner with it, both Photoshop, After Effects. Those do great things. Adobe works great. I want to keep that. And maybe in the future, if you ask for it, I can do a Adobe Premiere versus Final Cut Pro and I can tell you why Adobe's better. So that kind of sucked. No 4K video editing, which honestly is kind of a deal breaker for me. I wanted to see if I could get by with the cheapest MacBook Pro possible, no touch bar, but I kind of need a rig that can edit 4K. And if it can't do that, then this is technically a downgrade for me. So at the same time, we thought we could take it up a notch with our podcast footage. So we decided to film our next video podcast 1080p at 60 frames a second. So it can't do 4K, but maybe it can do multi-camera 60 FPS. There is four angles of that, right? So let's see how that does. Nope, nope, abandon ship, abandon ship. Crap, 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 nope. Lag like no tomorrow. So we hit a wall here with editing performance. What I thought it had no problem editing with was actually the limit of what it could do. So if you're an Adobe editor, I'm sad to say that's as much as you can do. You can do four multi-cameras at 1080p and you can do 1080 at 60 frames a second just fine. But if you want to go further than that, I, I'm going to have to say you need to get a bit more invested in the touch bar models. I even tried just three cameras at 1080 at 60 and it couldn't do that either. So I'm afraid that multi-camera editing just at 1080p or just regular editing at 60 frames a second, that's kind of the extent of what it can do. Yeah, that was sort of disappointing considering this is a pro laptop, but I guess it does make sense that it can't do everything because it is the lowest spec version possible. It even has a lower spec GPU than the next up touch bar 13 inch MacBook Pro. It has a slower processor than that one, less ports and all that. So maybe that one specs can do much better. Also something I wasn't expecting, this guy only has one fan. It's weird though because there's two vent shafts on the back. And when Apple did the keynote, I remember seeing, you know, when they took it apart that there were two fans on the inside that were built to be very silent. And when I was editing with this, I could only hear one fan on and I was like, crap, did I break the other fan? I couldn't feel any current coming out of this one. So I looked up a teardown of this MacBook. Yeah, totally different design on the inside compared to the touch bar model. It's not just the touch screen. That's not the only difference. This literally had to be rewired on the inside. Different circuit boards, only one fan. So does that make this air vent kind of just for aesthetics? I guess that's fine. If you need things to be symmetrical or you need a place to intake air, that's fine too. It's just not something you'd ordinarily think about. Now, while I'm talking about the fan, I have to compliment how insanely quiet it is. It kicks on usually when I'm editing a video 
real, but I never realize it. You can't even tell it's on. It's incredible. So I'm editing a video and I'm like, man, it's just doing quite a lot. So I would feel it and it feels warm, but it's never as hot as the last generation MacBook Pros would feel. I've made videos on those old laptops and those guys got hot, like boiling hot metal where the processor is. This guy never got that. He only got like slightly warm and the fan was on, but I couldn't hear it unless I held it up near my ear and I could be like, oh yeah, there's some spinning and current going on. But if it's just in my lap and I'm editing away on that, it's so quiet you can't even hear it. That's impressive to me. Something I'd expect from a MacBook. Now let's talk about gaming. <laughs> Why are you, why are you gaming on the, okay, no, I'll just, this chapter will be short. We'll just talk briefly about gaming just for kicks. I think running any game that has Valve's source engine is gonna do fine. That's games like CSGO and Portal 2. Those ran at 60 FPS at 2K, which was fine. I know those aren't high graphics level games, but yeah, anything at about that graphics level and below will do just fine. So yes, gaming is possible, just don't, okay, what? <laughs> Just don't try to do anything more advanced than Portal 2 or CSGO. Minecraft, obviously. Those are gonna be fine. I thought about boot camping Windows 10 on here and seeing if, I don't know, you could run Battlefield or Overwatch. So many people on YouTube have already done that. I think I know exactly what I find. You have to turn down all the game settings to low and you have to turn down the video resolution to low and then the frame rates are okay because Mac suck at gaming. We get that. Made a whole video about that. MacBooks aren't gaming PCs. We know this. However, if you're a light Light gamer, which if you're buying a Mac, I hope you are, not a pro gamer. Light gaming is gonna do just fine. The speaker upgrade is a very welcome change for me. They sound great and they get very, very loud. Much, much better than the 12-inch MacBook had, the last laptop, which only had one speaker grill. This has two on the sides and they fill the room up in the very high quality sound too. So just nice little upgrade there. While we're on the subject of sound, I have to bring up the highly controversial keyboard. And this is your guys' fault, you know. Back when Apple made the 12-inch MacBook, everyone was complaining about the keys not providing much physical feedback like other keyboards do. And this is Apple's move to make keys as thin as possible. And ultimately, I think it's their effort to try to make you used to not having feedback so that one day they can make the switch to complete touch controls. I think that's gonna happen and they're just slowly getting you used to it. But one of the most common complaints with that 12 inch MacBook was that people didn't like that the keys didn't give much feedback. So with the MacBook Pro, they try to fix it and now the keys are extra loud, they're clacky. But only if you're typing on it like you would type on a regular keyboard where the buttons actually go down really hard. You see, the keyboard I'm used to is my iPad Pro. I type on the virtual one all the time. I can type just as fast on that too. And I think if more people tried to do that, they would realize it's not that hard. People act like you need the keys to go down for you to type fast. You really don't. You can get used to a virtual one very simply. It just takes, I don't know, like an hour of typing on it and you're just as fast. So with this one, I don't slap my fingers on the keys that hard, but when I hand it to other people, they typically do because that's what they're used to. And it makes some pretty loud, noticeably clacky sounds which is, hey, physical feedback and auditorial feedback, but I can understand why someone wouldn't like that in a laptop. I don't mind it. I still love those ultra thin keys because if you're not looking at the keyboard, it feels like nothing's going down at all. To me, they feel exactly the same as the 12 inch MacBook. So I don't really notice a huge redesign there. And you know, the keys might not even be louder than before. It might just be at a different pitch than before. Because I know all keyboards make a sound and this is just a new sound that people aren't used to. It just stands out is what I'm saying. Right below that keyboard is an enormous trackpad. It is literally about twice as big as the last one. Lots of people were really, really worried about your hands accidentally triggering the trackpad. I have never accidentally done that a single time. Similar to when you're using the Apple Pencil on your iPad, Apple can register what is a palm and what is a pointer. And it's really interesting how they can do that. So if your palm ever is resting there, there's no confusion going on on the screen. The MacBook's like, no, 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 that's your palm. I'm not gonna read that. But it's not like putting your pointer near the edge of the trackpad is not gonna get registered. It's not like that's not activated space. It just knows. It can tell what a finger is. And the extreme size is really helpful, especially when you're dragging things across the desktop, moving files around. That trackpad is huge and it's a welcome upgrade. But once you get used to it, you realize if you switch to any other laptop, you'll be like, wow, your trackpad sucks. Dang, this is small. I was using a Surface Book earlier in the week and I was like, dang, the trackpad is so tiny because I got used to this and this is great. I also discovered when you're typing on a laptop that you rest your palms on the outside of the trackpad. You don't actually put your palms directly flat on the laptop. So usually when I'm typing, my palms aren't even touching the trackpad. They really thought through that, which is what I like about Apple. And the trackpad is even larger on the 15 inch MacBook Pro. So when we get that one, I'm really excited to try it out. It's even slightly larger than the Magic Trackpad 2 that they sell to accompany their iMacs. So it's cool to know that you can even have a trackpad advantage on the go. Something they didn't think through, however, is the ports on these 
these things. And I'm not talking about legacy ports they didn't include. I don't care about that, and you know that. So on this lower spec MacBook Pro, you're getting two USB-C ports and a headphone jack. I went through this whole headphone jack argument for months back before the iPhone 7 came out, when the iPhone 7 came out, and even before this MacBook Pro came out about how it's old Apple saying we don't need it anymore, the future is wireless. And I had gone through this whole it's time to stop and move on from the headphone jack. You guys will get used to not having it. And then they put it on the MacBook Pro. It's like, I, I, I heard why they did it. I still don't get it. They said it's because some Pro users still need optical audio. It's like, huh, since when does that bother you, Apple? I've been the guy reading all these comments saying, I need to charge my phone and listen to wired headphones at the same time. I can't do that now. That didn't bother you, Apple? But this does? At least they included an adapter with the iPhone 7. They helped that process of removing the headphone jack move along smoothly. I think they could have really easily just not had a headphone jack on the MacBook Pro to get people used to that. And if you do think professionals absolutely need that jack, include a little USB-C to audio jack adapter. You can include that. And I'm sure it can transfer audio just as good, if not better, because USB-C can transfer massive of amounts of data extremely fast, way faster than the headphone jack could ever do. I'm sure there's people in the comments right now typing, actually, I don't want to hear it. You're not changing my mind about this. Other thing, if they're only going to have two USB-C ports on the MacBook, put them on either side, not both on one side. I know on the touch bar models, you can go on either side, but it would be really handy that when you want to charge your MacBook, you can choose which side you want to charge from. That's the big advantage to USB-C, and they're not taking advantage of it here. All these MagSafe devices out there have that weakness of having to stretch the cord extra long when you need it to be on one side or the other. Also, when you're plugging in two different things on this MacBook, those cables are competing for space. So you've got your video output cable and your hard drive cable, and they're really close together, whereas they could breathe a lot better if you put a USB-C port on this side and this side. You can do better than this, Apple. It's just something I would expect Apple to think about, where this feels kind of more slapped together. Apple wanted everyone to use AirPods when the iPhone 7 came out. They believe the future is wireless, and if we had some headphones that could icon cloud sync to all your devices. That way there's no unpairing and repairing, plugging in or plugging out. Everything would just work. But now AirPods are delayed for some reason. We don't know. And we don't know when they're coming out. So now that's not an option. Now we have our lightning headphones for the iPhone 7 and regular audio jack headphones for our MacBooks. So now I'm carrying around two different kinds of headphones wherever I go. I almost wonder if having a lightning port on the MacBook would have been a better move. Because then I could at least have one pair of headphones. I don't know. I just think this could have been handled better. I do think it's very bizarre that with the cables provided with the MacBook, you can plug in a Google Pixel to this, but not your iPhone. That's messed up. Still though, I never do that nowadays. I've never connected my iPhone to my Mac for any reason. If I need to share photos or videos, I use AirDrop. If I need to sync music, I just use Apple Music. It appears there automatically. And if you absolutely need that, you can get a USB-C to lightning cable, $9 on Amazon. Oh shoot, wait, what about me? You guys all hate buying things. This right now. Accessory stock, oh my God. Uh, it's just, an how did I forget that? Sacrifice. It's not that bad, please. Oh, darn. Okay. In terms of overall design, I love how solid of a device it is. I know, like, the Surface Book is powerful and stuff, but the last time I was using it, I just remember thinking, this feels like a toy. It's hollow when you take the display off. You can't charge the display. The display itself, that's a tablet as well, I guess. That feels really light. When you press down on the keyboard of the Surface Book, the whole thing kind of bends a little bit. Where this feels much more put together. It's very light, but also has some good weight to it. It feels like it's packed full of stuff. Now, I know I've already talked about this, but I need to bring it up with any any MacBook purchase. Having an Apple laptop is incredibly convenient when you have an Apple ecosystem. The competition doesn't even come close to this. So when I open my laptop, it automatically unlocks because I have an Apple Watch. Or sometimes when I'm texting on my phone, the continuity icon will show up on the dock and I can even continue my text on the MacBook. So it's a really smooth transition over. Another amazing thing with iOS 10 and Mac OS, I can hit copy on my iPhone on some text and then go on my Mac and hit paste and it'll transfer over wirelessly. That's just magical. And of course, when I film something, especially when I'm filming cutaway shots for this video, I can wirelessly send it with AirDrop over to the Mac. And that's not internet dependent. That's the difference between using Google Drive or Microsoft Cloud. Any one of those services is I can AirDrop stuff if I'm out in the middle of the desert, if I'm up in the mountains and there's no reception, I can still send footage wirelessly to the MacBook. There's no other ecosystem that works that well together. Setting up MacBooks has also never been easier with iCloud Keychain, which means basically when I'm setting up my MacBook, I type in my Apple ID, sign in, and then it knows all my Facebook passwords, my Google passwords, my iTunes password, my iMessage account. Everything just sets up automatically 
and it's a very easy process to get going. Especially when it's already got all of your Wi-Fi passwords built in. So wherever you go, if you've signed into it with your iPhone already, or any iOS device already, it knows the password automatically. It doesn't need it. That saves a ton of time. So please don't underestimate the power of a unified ecosystem. That is why I'm okay with paying a little bit extra across all these products. Everything just works. So at the end of the day, the big question arrives. Does this MacBook Pro earn the Pro name? A lot of people out there are just gonna say no on the ports alone. It doesn't have an SD card slot, so it's not a Pro model, but I'm gonna say it does. However, in the lightest possible fashion. As in not someone editing with red cameras or 4K footage or anything like that. A lot of professionals are just audio designers or photographers or sometimes video editors that can just shoot stuff at 1080p. There's a lot of creative professionals who don't need to make that jump to 4K. 1080p can look amazing under the right circumstances. It's not all about resolution when it comes to how good your video looks. Like people who shoot with the Blackmagic Pocket Cinema Camera. Only can shoot at 1080p, but the footage looks awesome. And if they do edit multi-camera stuff at 1080p, they'll be able to handle it just fine. Or if they want to edit a single video 1080 at 60 like I do, it can take that just as well. So yeah, I'd say it earns the pro name because a lot of professionals out there would enjoy it, even if they are missing out on that touch bar. I have a better name for it though. MacBook. This should just be called the MacBook, not the Pro. Because this is standard, it's not super great, and it's not super crappy either. It's kind of right dead in the middle. I think the 12 inch MacBook, the lightest one, should be called the MacBook Air. Because you know, portability, that's the point. And then the Touch Bar MacBook Pros, those can be the actual MacBook Pros. They have the Pro GPU, the processor, and all that. Instead of having three different versions of the MacBook Pro, the not the lightest and 13 inch MacBook Air, the regular 12 inch MacBook, that's just too complicated. I've said this before, Apple sucks at naming things. But hey, we got a space gray MacBook Pro now. That alone is worth the money. I got a dislike just for that sentence. But still, that color is what I personally wanted and we got it. Sorry, Rose Gold and Gold fans, maybe they'll update it later. And to finally answer all of your complaints about using dongles and accessories and adapters, the transfer rates on the MacBook Pro are so fast that I think I'm spending equal or less amount of time importing stuff, even with the adapters, compared to last generation's importing process. Maybe I'm not, but at the end of the day, it's not that hard to plug in a little thing. It takes 10 seconds. Seconds. Importing takes 30 seconds nowadays with this guy with the incredibly fast write speeds and then you're done and you unplug it and that's it. This is really not that hard. For you super nerds out here, here are your geek bench scores. Compare that to whatever you want. And if you're an average professional, I think you're going to do just fine with this. I personally want something with a bit more exporting power that can handle 4K video and a bit more high resolution multi-camera editing. So I'm gonna be sending this back and at the end of December, we're gonna try out the 15 inch MacBook Pro. Just the base one. I'm not going great with the specs on it. It's expensive enough as it is. This is your Apple Sheep here, and I will see you in the next one.